So this is going to be a highly interactive session. We are going to use the ideas of our distinguished panelists and your ideas to build a scenario, to build a future that can limit global warming to the Paris targets no more than two degrees above pre-industrial and striving for 1.5. If the folks in the back could bring up my laptop and show the simulator, that would be great. And there it is. So let me explain why we're doing this in interactive format. Why don't I just give you all a lecture on the latest in climate science, climate economics, and climate solutions? First of all, many of you are very knowledgeable already about climate change and these issues. But even more importantly, research shows that showing people research just doesn't work. You've all been in these briefings where some expert shows you a million PowerPoint slides and nothing happens. People are bored. And so the only way you can learn about difficult issues like this is for you to learn for yourself. And so this is what we've done with my team at MIT and in partnership with Climate Interactive, a nonprofit think tank in Washington, D.C., with employees and team members all over the world, we have developed this interactive simulator, the En-ROADS Climate Solutions Simulator. So how does it work? Well, first of all, it runs in an ordinary browser, and it is completely free. So all of you can go home after this session and use it, share it, learn how to be an expert in it, and bring it to your communities, your companies, your faith groups, everyone. Your kids are going to love it. Senior politicians in your communities and your governments are going to love it. And it really makes a difference for you to do that. And at the end, we can talk about exactly how you can get those skills and access the simulator. Under the hood here is a complex dynamic model of our economy, the energy system, and the climate system. It's fully documented. It's totally transparent. I'm not going to talk about what's in there right now, particularly because I want to get us going on all these issues. So let me explain what you're seeing here and what we're going to be asking you and our panelists to do. So in this graph on the left, what you're seeing is total global primary energy use from the year 2000 through now, when we've carefully calibrated the model so it replicates the history up till now. And then going forward, there's a scenario based on the UN's climate, uh, excuse me, the UN's population projections. I'll show you that in a second. And uh, standard forecasts that are widely used in climate modeling for future economic growth in regions around the world. So take a look at this graph. We have total global energy use as the top line, and it's broken down by where that energy is coming from. So the brown band at the bottom is coal. The red band is petroleum, fossil gas is blue. In the model, wind, solar, hydro, geothermal, and other zero carbon renewables are separately represented because they have different costs and rates of technological progress and so forth, but they're added together in that green wedge. That green wedge are your zero carbon renewables. Then we have bioenergy of all kinds in pink and nuclear power is in blue. So where does that projection come from? It comes from the UN's most recent population projection in which they project that global population will reach 10.4 billion by 2100. And here you can see it broken down by region. The United States, Europe are down at the bottom, China and India are here, and all the other developing nations of the world, Africa, South Asia, other than India, uh, South America, et cetera, is in that blue line at the top, which is where most of the population growth going forward is projected to be. Now, if you don't like the assumptions of the model, you are free to change them. So for example, if you believe that population is going to be lower or higher going forward, you just grab this slider and you move it and you see that the model instantly re-simulates and shows you the outcome. So I'm gonna leave it at the base case and then we also want to see what the economic growth assumptions are. So if we look here, we see GDP per capita by region of the world, and the assumption is everywhere in the world is going to become more prosperous. But the historic discrepancies and inequities don't get resolved. That's a very standard assumption. We don't want that, but that's the standard assumption going forward. And again, you can change those assumptions if you want. 
I want to say one other thing before we dive into more detail, and that is this model, completely free, available not only in English, but in 19 other languages. So all you have to do is pick the one you like here, and if the one you think is important is not in the list, get in touch with us because these translations have been provided by volunteers, and we're happy to partner with people all over the world to be able to do that. In addition, if you don't like our assumptions, which are grounded in the best available peer-reviewed evidence, you're free to change them. So if you think that, for example, sea level rise is going to be higher than the UN IPCC projects, you just go in here and put in whatever assumption you like, and that's going to change future sea level rise. I'm going to stick with the baseline assumptions for today, but ask me whatever you want, and we can try it and see what, what difference it makes. So population and economic growth drive the energy use along with technology. So innovation and technology are very much part of the model. If we look here, this middle graph shows you how much energy is needed to produce a dollar's worth or a euro's worth of goods and services in the economy. It's been falling at about a little over 1% per year, and we're assuming that continues through the rest of the century. So technological progress is built in, and you'll also see here that the carbon intensity of the energy system we are projecting will continue to fall moderately as we go to 2100. But if you take global population, you multiply it by GDP per capita, that gives you the total gross world product of the entire planet. Multiply that by the energy intensity of the GDP, that gives you the total energy use that I just showed you a minute ago. And then you multiply that by the carbon intensity of the energy system, that gives you total emissions. So let's look at total emissions. So over here on the left, energy use, coal, oil, gas, renewables, bioenergy, and nuclear. On the right, the resulting greenhouse gas emissions. So let's take a look here. The green band are the emissions of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere from deforestation and land degradation. Soil erosion, thinning soils, that is about 15% of total global emissions today. Very important. The biggest contributor by far to greenhouse gas emissions is the gray band. That's the CO2 that's coming from burning your coal, oil, and gas, burning those fossil fuels. And in addition then, this yellow band, those are the fluorinated gases, the CFCs, the PFCs, sulfur hexafluoride. These compounds are very powerful greenhouse gases, and they last in the atmosphere for a very long time. Then the light blue is methane, a very powerful greenhouse gas, and purple on top is nitrous oxide, an even more powerful greenhouse gas. So what you see is those assumptions about population, the economy, technology, and so forth lead to growth in global energy demand, and that leads to growth in greenhouse gas emissions, and the consequences of that are Nothing short of catastrophic for humanity. So let's first look at temperature change. So here, what you see is where we're headed with global average temperatures. We're already at about 1.2 degrees C above pre-industrial levels right now today. And it's already causing significant harm to our health, our economies, our prosperity, our security. Under these assumptions, we pass the one and a half degree threshold by around 2030, and then we pass the two degree threshold by around mid-century, and it just keeps going up from there to 3.3 and would keep going after that. As I say, this would be catastrophic for all of us and for everyone on the planet. And I know that I'm putting my reputation as a scientist on the line when I use a word like catastrophe. There's really no other word for it. The IPCC in its typical anodyne science speak says severe and irreversible consequences with limited ability to adapt. In plain language, catastrophe. So let me show you why. Let's take a look at, for example, ocean acidification. It just keeps getting worse. What that means is creatures in the ocean of all sizes, corals, zooplankton, larger animals, cannot make their shells very well. This threatens the base of all the food webs in the ocean and many, many hundreds of millions of people who depend for their food and their livelihood on the sea. Let's see what else is going on. Because there's so much fossil fuel in the baseline, there's continued growth in dangerous air pollution emissions. This is PM 2.5. 
WHO tells us that air pollution kills 7 million people every year prematurely around the world. That's a consequence of where we're going as well. What else is happening? Well, under this scenario, crop yields are expected to fall significantly compared to the baseline. 19% reduction in the yield for corn, 16 for wheat, 8% for rice and soy. These are the big four that feed almost everybody on this planet. We can't afford to have this outcome when the world is expected to add 2.4 billion people over the next, uh, and by 2100. What else would be happening? Well, species are at risk of extinction. Let's take a look here. Every major family and category of plant and animal life is threatened with significant reductions in the viable ranges and many species will be at severe risk of extinction if we don't do something about this problem. What else would be going on? People will be dying from exposure to extreme heat, much hotter even than it is in this room right now. And it's going to be worst in the developing world, Southeast Asia, Southern Europe even, Africa, other places where wet bulb temperatures are the highest and air conditioning and other safety, safety net measures are least available. What else would be going on? Well, let's look at sea level rise. Under this scenario, we're looking at about 70 centimeters of sea level rise by the year 2100. Almost all scientists believe that is a significant underestimate given what's happening to the great ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica. But 70 centimeters, what would that mean? Well, let's take a look at what that would mean. So in our model, you can look at any coastal region anywhere in the world. This is the coast of the Netherlands, the Low Countries. Also, you can see what would be going on in England. At 70 centimeters, that's what would be happening here in Europe. What else would be going on other parts of the world? This is the Gulf Coast of the United States. Here's New Orleans over here. Houston over here. This would be devastating. But let me tell you, this is very optimistic because this is just the average. Doesn't count high tides. Doesn't count what happens when there's a storm surge from a hurricane. Hurricane Katrina had a storm surge of five meters. Let's, say, let's take a look and see what would happen if a even smaller hurricane came by the Gulf Coast after these 70 centimeters of sea level rise. And total devastation, wiping out not only a huge chunk of the energy industry, but other critical infrastructure in the United States, pipelines, power lines, internet backbone, rail lines, interstate highways, and this is still over-optimistic because it doesn't show the rainfall that comes with these storms. What else would be going on? This would be Shanghai after a typhoon. Total devastation. You have Nearly 30 million people living in this region here. Total devastation. Here's the important point. When you use the model yourself, you're going to want to look at where you live or where your friends live on the coast. But it doesn't matter where you live. You could live here in Paris, which isn't directly threatened by sea level rise. You could live in Tibet. You could live in Denver, Colorado, 5,000 feet above sea level. It doesn't matter because the refugees the people displaced by these events are going to want to move. They're going to need to move. And if this happens on hot borders, like the border between two great nations like India and Pakistan, you are at significant risk of geopolitical confrontation between two great nations who are both nuclear weapon powers. This is going to affect you no matter where you live. What are some of the other consequences of what we see here. Let's take a look at, for example, what happens to the economy. So all of those harms that you just saw and many others are going to hurt global economic growth. And the graph on the left here, and I'll make it bigger, shows the dashed line is, under our assumptions, what the global economy would do, how much the gross world product, the GDP of all nations added together, what it would do if climate change had no impact at all on the economy, which we know is wrong. It's already hurting our economy today. The line here is what a well-regarded peer-reviewed study suggests economic growth would actually be. Now, you may not think that this little gap here is 
that worrisome. But let me tell you, this is hundreds of millions, if not billions of people, especially in the developing world, not able to rise out of poverty into the global middle class. And just to put this in perspective, look at the magnitude of these losses every year getting bigger and bigger and compare that to the little dip in GDP that you see right there. That little drop that only lasted a couple of years, that's the impact of COVID on our global economy. I lost friends in the pandemic. Perhaps many of you have as well. If so, I'm very sorry for your loss. And we all experienced the economic harm. But take a look at the magnitudes. Compared to what's coming at us from climate change, COVID was a negligible blip. So with that in mind, that's a quick tour of the model. Now, what we want to know is what can we do to bend that curve and keep us under two degrees while striving for 1.5. Crystal, back to you. Thank you so much for that orientation to the model. That was super helpful. So I'm going to go to the panel now and try to get some of your ideas about how we stop these things from happening and build a safer, more prosperous world. So starting with you, Adelaide, can you talk a little bit about, with your work in combating climate change, what are the solutions or maybe the top solution that you think is going to get us there and in time, it's gonna have significant impact. Yes, thank you very much. First of all, it's it's very hard to see that we are still uh, aiming at it, going towards a 3.3 uh, degree warming planet. It's uh, obvious then that we, we have, all the work still needs to be done. We are 50 years late, uh, according to the first report that came out of the Club of Rome warming, uh, warning us of that uh, in uh, 1972. So I think uh, that's, as a young person, it's very hard to hear because that's 30 years before my, my birth. Um, but now we have no other choice but to act. And we just first, maybe the one thing I want to say is that this is an intergenerational conf, conf like combat, uh, fight, challenge that we will have to do together. Uh, and young people will have to get on board like all other generations. Uh, and what I see from the movements that, I'm, uh, that I, am, I am in, uh, movements that maybe you see in streets, that maybe you see uh, disturbing events, that maybe you see a bit going everywhere, lobbying, uh, using all the possible ways of taking a space to warn about this emergency. Uh, the first thing that these movements are calling out, and it's globally, it's not only in Western countries, countries is that we have to cut off all fossil fuel addictions, all fossil fuel projects, and that's not youth who are saying it, it's literally um, what uh, scientists are warning us. And so the best way to do that, that's kind of the question now, uh, whether at first I remember that I asked to cut off completely the coal and the oil. Uh, and I was like, okay, how is this gonna react? And I saw that apparently it had less effect than if we would put a carbon uh, price uh, on this. So we can maybe try the carbon price, but I do wanna warn that this is, we need to, if we wanna put a carbon price, we need to take into account the social uh, impact that it will have. And therefore, uh, in the, on the field, it would mean working with social movements to see how they will be uh, uh, implement, like how they, they will be included in this and making sure that they are not the one paying this, uh, this price. Um, and so I wanna bring in the social fairness here in this carbon price. And I don't know if you can play with that a bit. Great. Yeah, great. So thank you very much, Adelaide. Uh, so let's put a price on carbon pollution. So that's one of the levers we have down here. Now, Adelaide, do you have an idea of how big of a carbon price? And to put it in perspective, right now, approximately uh, today in the European trading system, it's about $100 per ton of carbon dioxide. Would you like to try that? Higher, lower? Yeah. So. Um, one thing that I want to precise also, it's, it's a bit hard because this is global actions, That's right? Correct. Right. I do want to precise that uh, I believe we all have different responsibilities depending on where we're from and therefore different countries uh, have different responsibilities. So obviously I would not have put the same thing uh, in, uh, would have not done the same thing for Western countries such as uh, Europe uh, comparing to other countries, but this is a, a, a global trial. So I would say um, that we have to go actually much higher than what the EU did, and the EU okay. right now is not 
I do want to precise is not including a social fairness in the way they're implementing that it. So correct. I don't I don't want to. I'm not. I'm saying I'm not copying what the EU is doing because I'm not necessarily supporting everything that they are doing. Okay. So let's try the carbon price with higher than what uh, the EU uh, All right. did. This, so this is great, and I really appreciate you bringing up the social and equity issues here. Let's start with $120 a ton. We can change it. Let's start with that. So you want to ask yourself, how much do you think that's going to lower the warming? We're at 3.3 now. If I put in 120, just let's do it this way. Raise your hand if you think it's going to be nothing. <laughs> Up to, okay, <laughs> we have two, three. How about zero to point three degrees of impact? That's about 15% of the audience. How about from point three to point six degrees of impact? That's about the same. More than that, you have to vote. You can't be neutral here. <laughs> okay, well, let's take a look. $120 per ton and 2.7. That's an enormous impact. This one policy has an enormous impact on projected warming. Now, why is that? First of all, it creates a huge incentive for energy producers to switch away from the fossil fuels, and especially coal, which is the most carbon-intensive fuel, but also away from oil, away from gas. And what you can see is, if I roll it back, the fossil fuel wedges here, coal, oil, and gas, let me make this bigger, they get much smaller. Whoops, I'll do it that way. They get much smaller, and the renewable wedge gets much, much bigger. On top of that, because energy has become more expensive to the extent that it's still dependent on fossil, the average cost of energy has gone up, total energy demand has gone down because this creates an incentive for everyone to invest in much greater efficiency, more efficient vehicles, switching away from a car to a bicycle or transit or walking, making your buildings more efficient. So it touches every part of the economy. It's a very high leverage policy. But now we come to the social dimension, right? This will raise the cost of everything, energy and everything that energy is embodied in, which is everything. And that's going to, if we don't do anything else, that's going to hurt the poor and the disadvantaged in every country of the world, and especially those in the developing world. So what can we do about that? And this is a real question I pose to the entire panel. You might go for it first, Aledi. What, what can we do to mitigate that harm? So in my head, there is first this cutting off of all new uh, extension or, or new coal and oil projects. Then there is this price. And in order to make it fair, we need to use, the, there, there, this is going to create a budget, an amount of money that needs to go back to the people directly. And for that, we're, we're not very good at that in the EU. Um, and to do, to do that, we need a, a financing mechanism that allows this gain um, to go directly back to uh, the most vulnerable uh, people, not only economically, but also the ones who are mostly touched by the consequences of climate change. And usually Fantastic. we end up to see that they so are the same people. So let's take a look at that. The carbon price is phased in over 10 years, so people have time to adjust and make plans to deal with it. And what you see here is the total revenue generated by the carbon price. And it rises steadily during the 10-year phase-in period. And it's peaking out here at $3.2 trillion per year. And your proposal is, let's give that all back to the people directly. And this policy has been proposed by people on both sides of the political spectrum in the United States and other countries. It's called the carbon dividend. And what it would mean is every one of you would get a direct deposit to your bank account. And if you're unbanked, if you don't have a bank, you would get a debit card or a cash payment every month, say, that would be your share of these $3.2 trillion. And most of that, you know, would go where the people are, and that's largely in the developing world. And it could be even more than the share that goes to the 
developed countries. That's something that would have to be negotiated out, but everybody would get their share of the revenue. And what's really important about this is affluent people, like all of us on the stage and all of you, everybody here is privileged and affluent, your carbon footprint is much higher than those who are at the bottom of the pyramid by about a factor of 6 to 12. So what that means is those people who are disadvantaged today, their carbon dividend would be bigger than the increase in the costs of energy and other goods that they would face because they don't have big carbon footprints. They don't have cars, they don't fly a lot, they don't have second and third homes and all the things that the billionaires do. And they would have more money after the dividend than they started with, even after accounting for the fact that petrol would be more expensive and so on. So the affluent, we, we would be paying more because our carbon footprints are bigger and we can afford it and it's our duty to do that. So this is a policy that would dramatically shift the equity story away from burdening the poor to advantaging the poor. So fantastic suggestion. Thank Crystal? you, Adelaide. I'd like to go to you next, Azada, and tell us a little bit about, with your work combating climate change, what do you see as a, a high-priority solution and uh, can get us there you know, in time? <laughs> OK, well, um, I work, or my focus is, uh, is soil, so nature-based solutions in general. Um, I see, John, that you have afforestation, deforestation scenarios in your simulator. So um, what if we go for 100% afforestation and see what is happening? Because we have millions of hectares, uh, just um, u useless soil that we don't use them. So what if that we go for planting more trees? This is exactly also what you're doing with your gre great green wall. Great. Well, thank you. So let's do that. Let's plant trees on land that's already been deforested and degraded. This would include things like simply restoring forests. It would also include agroforestry. Many, many policies would allow us to plant trees where none remain today. So let's take a look at that. So uh, I am going to increase afforestation. And, you know, if I go all the way, that's, if you've heard of the Trillion Tree Campaign, that's what we've got here. We're planting a trillion trees all over the world. And the green band that you see here, that is the amount of carbon dioxide that's being removed from the atmosphere every year by all those trees. And it's an enormous amount. It gets up to about 5.6 billion tons per year. That's about 10% of total global emissions today. Fantastic. And you can see here the green wedge of land use emissions is getting smaller and smaller, and it's almost zero by the end of the century. Um, so but I would like also to touch the topic of uh, negative emissions. Maybe you can also work with your simulator to, to, to clarify what negative emissions are, because agriculture is the only sector you want, you can remove carbon dioxide Great. from the atmosphere. So I will do that, but before we do that, how much of a difference did it make? We were at 2.7, it's two tenths of a degree benefit from a, a, a trillion trees. Why isn't it bigger? Two tenths is great, every tenth matters, but why isn't it bigger than that? There are a couple of issues that we need to recognize here. And listen, planting trees is great. I, I like to spend as much time in the forest as possible. Trees should be planted everywhere it's practical. It's a huge benefit for biodiversity, for providing fresh water, for providing land, preserving land for indigenous peoples around the world. It's really important, but it's not by itself gonna solve the climate problem. Now it helps, we're gonna wanna do some, but there's also a problem. Why doesn't it, why does it take so long before we actually get to this level of impact for the trees. And you know I'm a professor, so I have to call on the <laughs> folks in the, in the room. So. They have to grow. Yeah, <laughs> of course. It takes such a long time. When you if, you, if you've ever gone out and volunteered at an afforestation project, you're planting seedlings that have been grown to be about this big. They have very tiny leaves. They can't 
remove a lot of carbon from the atmosphere. And depending on the species and what the climate zone is you're dealing with, it can take 100 years for those trees to get big enough to really be moving a lot of carbon out of the atmosphere. We don't have that kind of time. We have to cut emissions down to net zero by around mid-century. So although this helps, it's not something that solves the problem immediately. There's another issue here. If you plant a trillion trees, how much land is it going to take? Well, this dashed line here, that's the total land area of India. And we would need more than double that to plant all these trees. So that's going to be a very serious issue. Will that reduce the land available for growing the crops we need to feed a growing population? What about the indigenous peoples who need the existing land for their livelihoods? This is going to be an issue. John, However, can we, can we do the agricultural uh, removal very quickly and then transition great. to Elaine? So now we come to agricultural practices, agroforestry, no-till, low-till agriculture, other practices that can sequester more and more carbon in the soils. So let's do that. And that's the yellow band you've got right there. So now we're removing, we have negative emissions now, of about 10 gigatons a year, 10 billion tons a year, but not until about 2060 and beyond. So what does it do for us? We're at 2.5 degrees. This is very substantial progress. We're on the way, and you can see the um, emissions there uh, are, are falling. Total emissions are falling. Great. So. Elaine, <laughs> we go to you based on your work. What are some solutions that you think are high priority? I thought the solutions in uh, uh, forestry would be more effective. But I can tell you that up here, I feel the heat of 1.2 degrees. <laughs> so uh, I don't want to be here when we are going to be at 3.3. Yeah. But uh, fortunately, I'm 61 years old, so I might not be here in 2100. You're very but young still. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm glad, to see so <laughs> I'm glad to see so many young people here. So uh, uh, I trust we are going to make the effort to reduce the, the climate damage that we have done. Uh, let's try to uh, work on transportation, maybe. Transportation. Yeah. OK. More Great. To be more uh, energy efficient in transport with uh, elect uh, electrification and energy efficiency, maybe. Terrific. Great. Yeah. So let's increase the efficiency of transport this will be for all forms of transport, land-based, so cars, trucks, SUVs, buses, long-distance trucking, rail, and waterborne, and aviation. They all can become more efficient, faster than they would otherwise. Now, the carbon price has already promoted efficiency improvements here, but we can do more. And I'll give you a quick example why we have to do more. How many of you live in an apartment where you pay the energy bills? A huge fraction of you. So that means the person or company who owns the building you live in has zero incentive to give you a more efficient apartment, upgrade the heating system, get you better windows, put in a more efficient refrigerator, because they would have to pay for that, and you get the benefits. This is known as the landlord-tenant problem. This is a solvable problem, but it doesn't get solved all by itself. We're going to have to work on it. So let's improve energy efficiency here in transportation. And there's another tenth of a degree. Every tenth matters. And now, let's also electrify transportation and another tenth of a degree. Let's take a quick look. This is the base case, how quickly electric vehicles, and we're only going to do land-based electrification. We're not looking at electric airplanes and waterborne shipping, although people are working on it. But, and we can try that in the model. But, here we have a tremendous acceleration of electric vehicle adoption around the world. And that takes off another tenth of a degree. So that's fantastic. What else should we be looking at? Maybe in building also. Do it? In construction. Great. So energy efficiency in the built environment. So this would be housing commercial properties and industrial processes, including the so-called hard to decarbonize sectors like steel and cement and so forth. Let's see what that does. So there's another two tenths. Why is that such a big deal? It's because there are a lot of buildings and a lot of industries 
around the world, and buildings and industrial processes in general can be retrofitted. You don't have to wait for those old cars to be finally, after 20 years, discarded. You can retrofit the apartments you live in now, work with your building owner, you can do that. That's fantastic. Now, let's also electrify. Is it okay we electrified the building sector too? Yes, of course, yeah. Great, so let's do that. And it didn't flip us over a full tenth of a degree. Now, why might that be? Well, first of all, let's see what it did do. We're at 2.13, we electrify, and we're at 2.08. So it wasn't a full tenth of a degree, it's a half a tenth of a degree, or a little more. That's pretty good. It has a big impact. Why doesn't it do even more? Well, even in this scenario, and this goes back, Adelaide, to your points, there's still some coal in the system. We've dramatically reduced the amount of oil, but there's still some coal, and there's still a fair amount of fossil gas in the system. Coal is abundant and cheap everywhere in the world. It's going to be pretty hard to get it out, even with the carbon price. So, what else can we do? This goes back to your very first suggestion. This might be a great time to go to the audience Just and see what second. they wanted to do. Let's phase out the rest of the coal, all right? Time. So, time. we can do that. Phase out the rest of the coal by not building any new coal infrastructure. All right, now, where are we? 2.07, we're getting close. Now, we still want to go for 1.5, so let's find out what all of you said. So, what you told us when we asked you to fill out the poll, 40% of you want to phase out coal, oil, and gas. We've already done an awful lot of that with the carbon price and stopping the not building any new coal infrastructure. And let's see what else is going on. The number two most popular suggestion is pricing carbon pollution. And that was the first thing we did. It's an enormously effective policy. And when you give the revenue back to the people, you change it from a policy that hurts the poor to a policy that helps the poor. Fantastic. What else do people want to do? Subsidizing and incentivizing renewables and nuclear power. All right. And then there's... Uh, improving energy efficiency, which we have done, and a few votes for fusion and carbon dioxide removal, deforestation reduction, we haven't, we, we've already done some of that, um, and then reducing the other greenhouse gases. So let's go back to the model and uh, see what happens when we do that. So I'm going to jump out here for a second and go back to our scenario. All right, so what else is going to happen here if we implement some of your suggestions. So we haven't yet reduced deforestation. That's interesting. Let's do that. Let's first take a look at the deforestation graph. So if we go here, we can see how much deforestation is occurring. In the baseline, it peaks around 2040 and then falls. And already, without an explicit policy to further reduce deforestation, it falls even more. Why is that? That's because we're down to 2.1 degrees of warming. And what that means is crop yields around the world are not going to be falling quite as much as they would in a world of 3.3. That means we don't need as much land, we don't need to clear as many forests in order to feed the growing population. But you're still seeing an awful lot of deforestation. So how can we reduce deforestation? One way is people could not eat quite so much meat. Let's see what that does. There's two degrees. A reduction in how much meat people eat. Now, it doesn't solve the whole problem. We're still at two degrees. And now we can see negative emissions from land use here. The green line is under that zero line. Also, what if we reduce food waste? Globally, about 30% of the food that's grown is wasted. It never gets to a person. So what if that could be reduced? And here in France, you've got a law now that says retail food markets and others providing food to the public cannot just throw away what they're not able to use. They have to find a productive use for it. So if we cut food waste, we're getting still more benefit. 
deforestation goes down even more. Now, there's still a lot of it happening, so policies that simply enforce no deforestation are going to be needed. And we're starting to see some of these implemented once again in places like Brazil. This can start to matter more. So there's a rapid phase out of deforestation, and if we can do that even faster than 30 years, do it in 10 years, say, now things are much better. We're actually at 1.96, we're under two degrees. This is looking very good. What else did you all want us to do? I think we have to cut off the, the oil and, and um, petroleum. I think we did already petroleum, but we didn't do oil and gas, all the fossil fuel. Yeah, we still have a fair amount of gas and some petroleum in the system. So the other really popular suggestion that came from the audience was to incentivize further growth in the renewables. So there's a lot of renewables here. We can incentivize further growth in renewables like this. And there, now, we're under 1.9, 1.91. That helps a lot. And then, actually, even more, po more popular than renewables was subsidizing nuclear power. So what, can I see some hands? Who would like to try that? Who thought that was a good idea? Quite a few of you. It was the number three after phasing out the, the, uh, the, the fossil fuels and the price on carbon. So let's do that. Right now, let's just see what's happening with nuclear right now. There's a small increase because the carbon price makes nuclear a lot more attractive, but then it goes down, and it's going down because the carbon price is reducing total energy demand so much, we just don't need so much, and the incentives we're providing for renewables are making renewables even cheaper. Right now, without any subsidies, let's take a look. Here's our base case. Let's take a look at energy prices right now today. Renewables are already cheaper than even coal in most parts of the world. That's the green line. And the brown line is the price of coal. And that keeps going down because of learning by doing and scale economies. And when you subsidize renewables, it isn't just the subsidy that lowers their price, it's that you speed up the deployment and so you get even more scale up and cost reductions from learning and scale up. So if we go back to our scenario and we do that, then nuclear becomes even less competitive. Nuclear is up here, it's extremely expensive. So what happens if we subsidize it heavily? So we can do that right here. Notice we're at 1.9, and now we get a lot more nuclear, a lot more. What happened to the temperature? What happened to the temperature? Did it change? No, it didn't change at all. Why? Okay, this is another point where I call on people. So, how's it at? Why? Why didn't nuclear do us any good for the climate? We're getting more nuclear, it's not lowering the temperature. Um, do you mean the byproducts of uh, the nuclear, or what do you mean by not decreasing the temperature? Right here, 1.9 degrees. Yes. And if I take away the You're subsidy. You're talking about life cycle assessment? It's still 1.9. Right? So the issues you're bringing up about life cycle energy use of building nuclear plants, which is included here, waste disposal, security concerns, the uranium supply chain, those are all very, very important. Proliferation risk, accident risk, terrorism risk, very important. That's not what's going on here. What's happening? Let's take a look over here. If I subsidize nuclear, take a look. Here's nuclear now, blue line up here and look at the green wedge. It's what happens to the renewables when we heavily subsidize nuclear power? Renewables go down. That makes perfect sense. If I give huge subsidies to electric utilities to build nuclear power plants, they will. And they're therefore gonna build fewer utility scale solar plants and offshore wind farms. And so, virtually carbon-free energy, other than the life cycle impacts, in-use nuclear, let's just assume, is zero carbon, but you're also reducing the zero carbon production from wind and solar and geothermal and hydro. So there's a direct offset impact. This is why nuclear doesn't do very 
much in our model. So I'm going to take that away because it would be hugely expensive for no benefit. And let's go back. We're at 1.9. Can we do better than that? Well, if you go back to what you all suggested, and I think we can do that very quickly, what you all suggested, we've done a lot of these things. Nuclear didn't help us. Renewables did. Phasing out the fossil fuels, pricing carbon pollution, we've done that. Fusion, we're not really going to look at that because we can't promise it's ever going to happen. We can look at it. We'll see how the time goes. But uh, improving energy efficiency, we've done. And then, you know, 1%, not very many, have voted for reducing the other greenhouse gases. Does that matter? So this is the methane. Take a look at the mix. Starting by around 2040, all the actions that the panel and you all have suggested have dramatically reduced the carbon dioxide from burning fossil fuels, from land use and deforestation. Fantastic. That's how we got under two degrees. But the biggest remaining source of greenhouse gases is now methane, nitrous oxide, fluorinated gases. We haven't done much there. Let's take a look. We have done a little bit. And the reason it's lower now is we have much less production of oil and gas, and so we have far lower fugitive emissions of methane from the energy supply chains around the world. That's lowering the emissions of methane and the other non-CO2 gases. Fantastic. But they're still quite large. They're still growing a little bit. So let's cut that back. 1.8, 1.7. There's 1.6. 1.6. There's still some, it's going to be very difficult to get it all the way to zero, but take a look at what you've all done. Here's a scenario at 1.6 degrees above pre-industrial levels. I'm sure, and I'll leave it as something for you all to do. Build on this scenario, try your own, see what it would take to get to 1.5 in a way that you think is plausible. But let's just Pause for a second. Let's have a moment of silence because what you have done, what our panelists and you all in the audience have done, is you have created a much, much safer world for you, for your children, for every child all over the world. So let's just have a small moment of silence to reflect on what you've done here, and what you need to do to make it happen in the real world. Take a moment. So what are you thinking now? You've created a much safer world. And let's take a look at what some of the benefits of this would be. So if I go back to the impacts. Temperature, much, much lower and starting soon. And what does that mean? It means, for example, ocean acidification would keep dropping for a little bit, it would keep getting worse for a little bit, but then it stops and even begins to recover. That's a huge increase in the health of the oceans. The corals will thank you. The fish will thank you. Everybody who depends on the ocean will thank you. What about air pollution? The carbon price and the efficiency improvements and all the other actions that the panel and you all have suggested dramatically cut the amount of dangerous air pollution that is hurting and killing people prematurely today. You've just saved millions of lives every year. What else would be happening in the world you've created? Crop yields, they're still going to fall relative to where we are today and the baseline going forward, but the amount that they are expected to drop has been greatly reduced. This increases food availability for those who are hungry around the world. It makes it possible to feed the projected 2.4 billion more people expected by 2100. 20, 
and it means we need less land deforested and degraded to produce that food. Fantastic benefits. What else? Every species of animal and plant around the world will thank you. They won't be going extinct or at risk of extinction to nearly the same degree. Deaths from extreme heat, they're still going to increase, but not nearly as much as they would have. This is a much safer world. Now, I want to be clear. It's not a safe world. As you mentioned at the beginning, we've waited too long. Nothing we can do about that now. But what you see here is things are going to keep getting worse. But by God, this is a much safer world for everybody. So it matters that we do this as fast as possible. And then take a look at what's happening in the economy. Economic growth around the world is much, much better. And that means billions of people will now have the chance to rise out of poverty and enjoy the privileges that everybody in this room has today. So congratulations. Now, after that minute of silence, give yourselves a round of applause. You've done something amazing. I'd love to go back to the panel now and get some of your final thoughts on this experience, maybe what you were thinking about in that minute of silence. Um, any reflections that you have about uh, anything that you want to emphasize before, before you leave? And uh, Adelaide, I'll start with you again. Um, thank you for this. It's a, it's a great trial. Uh, I wish it was this easy. Um, because now we have to actually implement that, which is not the case. It's not happening today. This is not where we are. Uh, we don't have this in our governments. We don't have this in industrial um, companies. So, so this is still everything we have to build. I see that in 2100, we still have oil and gas. So I don't know if, if, this, is, if this is great. Uh, at least I don't know if I want to live in such a world with still this energy, but let's see if uh, we can reach the 1.5 with that. Um, so I think what I remember from this is that we have so much work on the table and we need this to be implemented today, actually. Um, and if we want to implement this today, we have no other choice but to take our responsibility and make sure this is happening in every single sector. We are all part of a certain environment, a certain world. We have people around us and we need to go and reach those people. We need to make sure that we are putting this on the table. And at least on my side, I'm just a young student, not necessarily have a special role in society, but that does not matter. I still have a role. I have a role to go and get those leaders to get this on the table, to make sure everybody realizes the pressure that we have uh, to put this on the table and to actually make that happen. And so I think really what I want to get from this is that so much work has to be done and we all have a role in that collective change that we need to put in place without forgetting the social justice aspects in the change that uh, is going to be put forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do you want I, to take yeah, a question? Um, I want to go through the panel first and make sure that okay. you guys all have a chance to speak. Uh, well, and we can um, do that after, too. I think it depends on solutions and recommendations what, um, at the end of the day, people should adopt. Mm -hmm. If their solution is not attractive enough for the farmer, he's not going to adopt it. If the solution is not attractive enough for a country producing oil, gas, he is not going to adopt it. At the end of the day, what matters is that the solution is easy to adopt and economic visible or visibility it has. Mm -hmm. So we need to take care of our solutions if they're going to be adopted on the international level or not. Thank you for that. Ali? Yeah, what uh, this model showed us is that uh, we, we all have to uh, act together to attend this, you know? Uh, because when I look at the three cops, we have three cops today. One cop uh, talking about uh, climate change, one about biodiversity, and one about drought and desertification. The three presidents of the cops decided to work together today. They can't work separately.
because it's all the same problem. And when I look at uh, the oil reduction, use of oil reduction, at the last COP, uh, climate COP, the African countries and developing countries said that they are discovering uh, new um, energy, uh, uh, oil and gas. And the developing countries don't want them to use that for the development. So what are they going to do? How are you going to have those countries not using the new energy that they have? You have to work all together. As we said, if we reduce something, you have to be able to uh, uh, reallocate the economy that you do on the, uh, uh, to the others. So you have to share. It's a, all, it's a problem that we have to face together. Unless we do that, 2,100 is going to be really tough here. <laughs> Thank you for that. John, so, I hand it back to you. So Thank you all so much for those wise and important comments. Yeah, I'll let him. And uh, I fully agree. You know, it's easy to pull a slider in a simulation like this. How are we going to get that to happen in the real world? That's the challenge that every one of you needs to stand up and face. And we can do it. Time is short, there's no time to waste but we can do it. I want you to notice here, there's no one thing that we can do that's gonna solve this challenge. We're gonna to have to do many different things and we need to get going right now. In some sense, that's good news because it means that whatever your expertise is, whatever you've studied, whatever your passion is, whatever you're doing now, we need you. We need you to work on afforestation and deforestation reduction, on reducing the methane and the nitrous oxide and changing agricultural practices and speeding electrification of buildings and transportation and industry and boosting efficiency of everything everywhere in the economy and lobbying and getting active and demanding a carbon price with the 